First Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 8 is where we're going today. Title of today's message, This Thing I Know. This Thing I Know. Just the main idea of the morning would be that the church preaches the simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power and it's God's wisdom. God's wisdom is in the cross. And I just remember, oh, probably eight years ago or something, and our church was going through uh, what I just always call the Calvinism debate. I think every church goes through it. Um, and uh, just, you know, wrestling through uh, just folks in the church that really wanted to major on um, uh, reformed type theology. And uh, just, I remember Adam Barney leading worship and a song the Lord had gave, given him for that time was um, the simple gospel, you know, a song about the simple gospel that you know, that the church preaches the simple gospel message of Jesus Christ because God's power and God's wisdom are in the cross. They're in the cross. Now, Paul had arrived in Corinth after a tough time in Athens. If you read the book of Acts chapter 17 and 18, uh, he had preached the message of the gospel in Athens to the philosophers. And um, some would say that it was a colossal failure, that his message was a failure. I don't hold that view, but it doesn't seem that many, many were saved and believed. But, uh, you know, as, as perhaps Paul is coming off of that tough time in Athens, um, he might have been questioning his methods at that point. As you look at the area of Athens and Greece, crowds would gather in the ancient world around a rhetorically gifted or impassioned speaker. And in many ways, they still do, right? But if people were gathering towards eloquence or wisdom in the sake of church gatherings, then a more eloquent or educated person would show up and the crowd would disappear. And so perhaps for Paul, after a rough time in Athens, he was asking himself, should I adjust my methods? Should I adjust my message? And his conclusion was clear. I won't change a thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. Once a church had a painting of the crucifixion hanging right behind the pulpit. The pastor was a big man and he would block the view of the painting. One Sunday, the pastor was absent, and in reference to the painting, a child asked his mother, where's the guy who stands so we can't see Jesus? And Paul was always trying to avoid that being said of him. Sandy Adams said, rather than relying on his oratory skills or his keen insights, Paul's goal was to point people to Jesus. A pastor's worst mistake is to use the pulpit for self-promotion or to show off. Don't ever block anyone's view of Jesus. And so in verses 1 through 5 of the text today, we see Paul's reliance on the Holy Spirit. And we see the Spirit in proclamation. In the proclamation of the gospel, the message must be simple. Look at verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. So Paul is addressing a prideful Greek 
culture that the Corinthians lived in, they put much stock in great oratory skills and philosophical wisdom. And Paul says that's not what he came with when he ministered the gospel to them. That's not how I caught you and that's not how I'll keep you. Paul had determined in his soul that he was an ambassador, not a used car salesman. He was an ambassador, not a Christian salesman. And he says in another place, I wasn't peddling the gospel. You think of kind of the Old West films, you know, and there's the guy with the wagon with all the bells and jingly things, you know, and the, you know, what would you call it? Like the snake bite uh, medicine, you know, or one of those kinds of the tonic, you know, peddling wares or whatnot. And, you know, you always kind of had to have an eye out for those guys that they weren't swindling you. And, and, and Paul just is like, man, I, I'm not a salesman. I'm an ambassador of the gospel. God had saved and called Paul to preach, not to perform. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what he saved and called us to, to preach the gospel. Don't get hung up on your performance. And he says why there in verse 1. Uh, I did not come with an excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring the testimony of God. So I didn't come with brilliance when I brought the mystery of the message. A gal named Helena Mojeska was a famous actress at the turn of the 20th century. One time at a party, she was asked to perform. She presented an amazing oratory in her Polish tongue. And the crowd was so riveted by every word. Her presentation was powerful. It was emotion packed. It was soul stirring. And it was also later revealed that all she had done was recite the Polish alphabet. I read that this morning and I spent a little time sitting in my chair just imagining how powerful the alphabet could sound in, in another language. Ah, ah, B, C, D, E, F, H. And if you had, you'd just be like, I don't know what he's saying, but mm, the passion, alpha, beta, you know, just, just really preachers who could impress us with oratory but they don't really say anything. And they can say nothing better than you've ever heard it before. And so really what matters is not the method, but the message. John Henry Jowett lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was pastor of the Westminster Chapel in London. It's reported that he said this, what we're after is not that folks shall say at the end of it all, what an excellent sermon. That's a measure failure. You are there to have them say when it's over, what a great Savior. What a great Savior. And Dr. Aiken says it's something for men not to have been in your presence but in His. And I hope that that's really what you get at Calvary Chapel, that at the end of it all, it's not about the pastor or the speaker or the worship team and their performance, but you leave this place having met Jesus, having encountered the gospel and heard it afresh, applied to your life, cherishing the gospel. So the message must be Simple, and the message must be clear. Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I hope you enjoy crosswords. 
because that's what the gospel is. It's crosswords, Andrew Taylor said. Paul kept it simple when he was evangelizing the Greek, speaking the gospel simply, speaking crosswords. He determined it was a purpose in his heart that that's how he was going to speak to these people who were especially prideful in their philosophies and and, uh, oratory skills. I think it was Ira last week. I didn't listen to the message, but I think he did verse 23 of chapter 1, where Paul says, We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. We're preaching Christ crucified. When the Greeks hear this, it's just foolishness. Is there much more foolish than a hero that died. To the Jews, it was a stumbling block. Dr. Aiken said, when you preach or share the gospel, keep the method simple. Be sure to point to people to Jesus, not to you. If Christianity ever loses the centrality of the cross, It will lose Christianity. And Paul just knew his message needed no adjustment. He shared its unvarnished clarity. And he trusted God's spirit to do the work. Now, Paul's point was not that using language well or organizing a sermon so that it made sense or kept people's attention that's not bad but he never did it to draw people to himself he never did it in a way that would detract from or substitute for the message of Christ crucified he wasn't embarrassed of the gospel and so he had to kind of hide the message of the gospel under a sugar coating of you know bells and whistles and smoke and lights There's nothing wrong with giving people a free meal after church or some bounce houses, (laughs) you know, or a barbecue in the park, as long as the whole focus is about Jesus. And so the message must be dependent on God, verse 3 goes on to tell us. So it's simple, it's a simple message, it's a clear message. Jesus Christ and him crucified. I almost feel like I'm going too fast, you know. I just think so often we're afraid to share the gospel because we're just not sure we have all the right words. And I think the right words are tell people that Jesus loves them. Tell people that Jesus died on the cross for them. Tell, Jesus, tell them that Jesus rose from the dead. Just put that in their think tank. Put it in their crock pot to simmer as they lay their head on their pillow at night. They'll remember that religious zealot that spoke with them at work that day and really had nothing fantastic to say except someone died for them. Let that roll around in their heart and in their head. The message must be dependent on God as we share it. In verse 3 it says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I remember hearing the story of Charles Spurgeon's Bible College, or it might have been called a school of ministry, but that uh, in the class, and sometimes Bible colleges do this, the students were given uh, uh, the opportunity to reach their hand into a hat, pull out of the hat a slip of paper that had a random sermon subject on it, and they had to immediately step up in front of the class. Now, this was done in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, and so the student had to go to the stage and climb the stairs and ascend the pulpit 
back in the day before microphones and things, they had this pulpit with a staircase that would curve up around and they had to go up and stand up in the pulpit and give a mock sermon really at the drop of a hat uh, in front of Spurgeon and the Bible College. And the story is told that one day a guy reached into the hat and he pulled out a slip of paper and it said, Jesus's encounter with Zacchaeus. And the guy let out a sigh and stood up and went to the staircase and ascended to the top of the staircase and stood up at the pulpit that Charles Spurgeon would preach from. And he said, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And I am a wee little man. Zacchaeus was up a tree. And I am up a tree. Zacchaeus came down. And I am coming down. <laughs> and then he went down the stairs and went and sat down. And it's the only message that was remembered from that class. <laughs> this guy knew his proper place, who the Lord was and who he is. And, oh, I, I just try to remember that every time I come to the pulpit. One of my greatest times with the Lord before a Sunday is Sunday morning when I put a blanket down on the ground in our living room and I just get down on my face and and I just spend time getting down as low as I can and elevating the Lord as high as I can and just knowing if anything good comes out of this Sunday, Lord, it's going to be because of you. Gordon Fee said, well, really as, uh, <clears throat> as we get into this, I was there in weakness, verse 3, in fear and in much trembling. Paul is writing autobiographically right here and very transparent. And Gordon Fee says, his own weaknesses served as a further visible demonstration of the same message. I was driving back from the Papanaw fire yesterday and I was like, oh, I'm just going to let Siri read to me from my Kindle book from Gordon Fee on 1 Corinthians. And I'm just driving up the grade, coming out of post, and letting Siri read. And it read to me that from Gordon Fee. His own weaknesses served as a further visible demonstration of the same message. And so Paul just, I was there in weakness. How's he put it? In fear and much trembling. And he says, you know what? And I bring a message that's going to appear that way to your flesh when you first hear it. Fee went on to say, but even more to demonstrate that the message was of divine, not human origin. He was not self-confident when he came to Corinth. He wasn't cocky. He was scared and he was weak. And the apostle knew that if anything good would happen... It would be God's doing. Today, when we come across an intimidating assignment, we might say, oh, it's beyond me, or it's above my pay grade, or it's over my head. And uh, Paul says, you know what? That's what my ministry is. It's just, it's above and beyond anything that I can offer as a man. In the next letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Paul says, I take pleasure in all of my infirmities and my reproaches and all of my need. Everything I'm lacking, I take pleasure in that because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I understand who I am, it makes me look at who the Lord is and I'm strong because I appeal to his grace and strength. So Paul talks about how I came in weakness and fear and in trembling. And I wonder if the Corinthians ever noticed that in him. I wonder if the Corinthians ever picked up on his fear and his trepidation. You don't really get the sense of that when you read the book of Acts. But Paul seems to think that they picked up on it. I mean, when I read the Acts account, in Acts 18.4, it says, 
So Paul's in Corinth. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. That sounds like a stallion to me. That sounds like a champion. That sounds like a guy that's just bold and reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading Jews and Greeks. I, sounds like a confident guy to me. Or in two verses from there, it says, But when people opposed him and blasphemed, Paul shook off his garments and said, Hey, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. Doesn't sound like a scaredy cat to me. Sounds like someone that was bold and brave and courageous and had a bunch of haters. And he said, all right, like, like if that's what you want, enjoy the wrath of God. I'm going to go to a people that are ready to hear the message. But Paul writes autobiographically here in Corinthians and just says, I was there with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And that's got to be true because at the end of Acts 18, I'm sorry, it wasn't the end. It's uh, in the middle of the accounts, just verses 9 and 10. The Lord came to Paul by night in a vision and said, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. So you're reading the book of Acts and you don't even really get the sense that Paul's afraid. It seems like God's moving in, in mighty ways. And there he went to bed that night and maybe he went to bed difficultly. Uh, is that how you would say that? Maybe he went to bed difficultly. Yes, that works. Um, you know, and he just tossing and turning and worried and the Lord just graciously appeared to him and spoke to him that, hey, it's going to be okay. And back in our text in verse 4, he says, And my preaching and uh, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. This is one of my favorite verses as a pastor, as a preacher. I just constantly am praying that what I bring isn't about human wisdom, worldly persuasiveness, Stuff that's going to tickle the ears of the world uh, and, and have no power of the gospel behind it. I'm regularly praying this prayer uh, by word that it would be in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I'd encourage you to pray that over your uh, ministry that you have. Uh, in the church with the kids or with the youth or the ministry you have out in the community, you wanting to be a light, you know, as a coach or as an employer, as an employee, just pray, oh Lord, just let it be a demonstration of your spirit and of power. I went out to the Rossi Ranch this week and, and uh, took a, a fire water trailer out there and uh, just bought... Arby's for the fire crew and Gatorade and ice and took it out there and I'm driving out there I'm like I'm not a firefighter some of you are firefighters and I'm not so I gotta <coughs> pretend to be one um, and so I, but I'm coming out to all these ranchers that are just fighting fire and I was just praying like Lord I'm coming out here and I'm being what I'm not and Lord I just pray that you would just come through me and let me be what you are. And I just, just pray that he just fill me with joy and light and hope. And that all of the, the Arby's and the curly fries and the Gatorades and the, all the, just the things that would just bring, bring refreshment to these ranchers that are just weary and thirsty. That it would just be the gospel for them would just bring a fresh just revival to their soul. And I just believe the Lord did that out at the Rossi Ranch this week. They, there was just this, uh, just people were saying, I'm so thirsty. Oh, there's Gatorade. And they were going over to the cooler. And I mean, never saw people get so excited about Arby's in your life. I was, I was going to bring them fried chicken from Ray's, but the deli was closed. I'm like, well, there's Arby's. And, and just they chopped it up into a bunch of sandwich pieces and handed it out. And just people were 
just refreshed. And I was like, Lord, just let this be a demonstration of what your spirit brings in the midst of a burning world. But that we would open up our mouths and share the gospel with that type of power or dynamis it is in the Greek. We just finished Romans. At the end of Romans, do you remember where it said that when Paul went and preached the gospel, it was with mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. I just praying today for rain in central Oregon, and I was just like, Lord, here we are, Lord. We are a church that believes in your mighty signs and wonders. Never to replace the gospel and just get people all stoked about crazy, ecstatic, and dramatic things happening. But Lord, we believe in signs and wonders that they uh, show the gospel to be true. So just like Elijah would pray and it would not rain and pray and it would not rain. And Lord, right now even, we just pray that you would let it rain in Central Oregon. Let it rain right now. Let there be signs and wonders in Central Oregon that people would, uh, they would know that the gospel is real. Right after we prayed that, Adam texted me. He said, my God is so big that he let it rain in town and not on all the hay I have down. Hopefully they're getting this out on the fires. It was like when he parted the Red Sea this morning, you could draw a line across the pavement on the way to town. And so, Lord, just we just pray, Lord, persistently right now, um, Lord, that you would dump rain on all the fires, that uh, the demonstration of your spirit and power would be seen here in, the, in our area. In Romans 1.16, it's probably a memory verse that you've had where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that part? You probably had the t-shirt, right? You probably had the bookmark or something like that, bumper sticker. That's a good bumper sticker, actually. I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, boy, I butchered that. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so I just encourage you guys, every one of you is called to be a missionary out in this world. And I just encourage you, open up your mouth this week and tell someone about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And don't worry about any, any gimmicks, okay? Don't worry about any apologetics like, oh, I haven't like watch the latest Greg Kokel video or something on YouTube. Like, don't worry about that. Just open your mouth and tell people about Jesus. Because it is the power of God into salvation. The gospel is power. And so I just encourage you, tell someone about the Lord this week. The demonstration of the spirit and power. And last little verse about that. Do you remember the baptism with the Holy Spirit that Jesus talks about in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the farthest parts of the world. Man, the Holy Spirit comes upon us so that we would be brave witnesses for him. I just looked over and saw my son, Russell, and if you'll let me just do a dad brag for just two seconds, okay? Um, so I just told Russell this week, as he was on his way to bed, I just said, son, I'm so pleased with you. I'm so pleased with you. This is a kid, you guys, I remember when he was about eight years old or so, he wanted to know about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we prayed for that. And he was baptized with the Holy Spirit as a little kid. And he just went out preaching the gospel. And it's just been incredible this year. He believes the Lord's called him to go back to the public school. And he's just taken as many classes as he can take so that he can play soccer. And that he can, um, you know, so he has to take, there's no more electives available, all the classes. So he's just taking 
like classes that he doesn't even need to take just to be with kids so he can share the gospel with them. And in his literature class this week, he had to bring an item in that would be like more of a, uh, a symbol of something deeper than what it really is. And, and so he was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my Bible. And it's more than a book with pages. I'm going to tell people about how valuable the Bible is to me. And another kid in the class did that. And he's like, oh, rats, what am I going to do? And he looked down on his hand. The Eslos are going to love this. He looked down on his hand, and there was the gospel bracelet with all the colors. And he said, I had about one minute to go through it, or two minutes to go through it in my head. And he stood up in class, and he went through the gospel bracelet and told his whole class about the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And, and he just came home, and he's just beaming um, just shining because he got to share the gospel with his class. And I just would say, you guys, the Lord has the same thing for you. Like, you do, it's nothing special. It's not Russell. It's not me. It's just you, Christians, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses. You'll testify. Sometimes it just requires like prying that mouth open and telling people. And watch the Lord move. I know for me, when I have those moments, I feel like I'm having an out-of-body experience sometimes. Not to be weird or this guy believes in weird, you know, it's nothing like that. But where I see the Lord doing it and I'm almost a spectator watching him. And I'm able to just give him all the glory as, as he does it. Again, it's still okay to prepare and to have a palatable message. Paul knew that what we say is more important than how we say it. But he also knew that how we say things is important too. Curtis Vaughn uh, was a distinguished professor of New Testament at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He said, nothing in Paul's words should be seen as an invitation to the contemporary preacher to make his words dull and insipid. God's message is to be presented in a creative, arresting manner. The gospel must also be plain, clear, and undiluted. Paul feared greatly the dilution of the gospel by an excessive emphasis on form. So long as the content of the gospel is kept intact, the method of presenting it may be adjusted to the audience. Charles Spurgeon was known to say when he entered the pulpit, he'd repeat the words, I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Just as I'm going up there, I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The motive must be sincere. Look at verse 5. We're only going through verse 8 today. The motive must be sincere. Verse 5 says, It's so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Probably would have been good to read that before I just expounded on the previous verse. But a demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith should be not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, we have the treasure in earthen vessels. We're like jars of clay. You know, have you guys heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in those jars of clay near Qumran? Uh, famous set of uh, ancient scriptures. Uh, we're like those uh, pottery vessels, earthen vessels, and... Uh, that, so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We're just fragile, but the message is bold and powerful. Paul says to the Thessalonians, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. Dr. Aiken said, Saving faith must have a saving object. That object is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And uh, Leon Morris quotes A.G.B. Wilson, who said, A faith that depends on 
clever reasoning may be demolished by a more acute argument, but the faith which is produced by the power of God can never be overthrown. And so you may really want those bells and whistles and the comedy routine and the smoke and the lights and the mirrors and the oratory of a Christian Barack Obama or something, you know, just someone that's just easy to listen to, you know, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I'm not talking about the message, but, you know, I kind of like listening to Barack Obama um, in his style. And, uh, you know, but you may not know this, and this is not talking towards Barack Obama, but one mark of who the Antichrist is going to be in the future is that he is going to be a golden-tongued little rascal, you know? And, and people are going to be drawn to his speech. So don't let that be the factor of why you go and listen to somebody. I think you're pretty safe here with this guy. You know, I mumble and fumble and bumble around uh, every now and then. But <clears throat> And then in verses 6 through 12, we're only going through verse 8 right now. We just see how Paul knew he needed the Spirit to come in revelation and in inspiration. And in Revelation, he would give a wisdom that would last. Verse 6 shows us a wisdom that will not last. It says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So I don't know if you're following this. Paul is saying, hey, I didn't come to you with clever little speech and great uh, oratory skills. I came in weakness and fear and trembling. I came just with the demonstrate. The message I brought was in the demonstration of the spirit and power. You learned then to trust in the power of God and not in some man. And so when I'm teaching and discipling, I'm going to speak a wisdom to Christians who are mature. You're going to get it. But to the world, they're not going to get it. The way that the world thinks in this eon, in this age, all those who are coming to nothing, a, a world that's uh, wisdom that's temporary, those people are not going to appreciate it. And I love that the word wisdom here is Sophia. I think that's such a beautiful name. And uh, I think we have a little Sophie Camposano in our church. We have a little wisdom girl. Uh, in our church. And um, Sophia is such a beautiful thing, but that's when it's godly. When it's a worldly wisdom, it's changeable, it's presumptuous, it's fallible, and the Lord wants Christians to embrace a godly wisdom. It's divine, it's eternal. It's enjoyed by those who are being perfected and matured. NASA scientist Robert Jastro said, The scientists for years have been scaling the mountaintops of knowledge. And as we made it up to the crest, what did we find? The theologians had been there for years. <laughs> Oh, science and science and the scientific method. And we got to figure all this stuff out and figure it, figure it, figure it. And we get up there, it's like, then the people who believe in God had already been there and known it all. Because that wisdom from above, it's pure, it's eternal, it's spiritual. It's not anything other than the good news of the gospel. To the world, the cross looks like the height of foolishness, but it's actually the height of wisdom. It's foolish in worldly terms. It always has been a bleeding, naked, impaled Jewish man. It's not typically the role model for the world who they typically look for. Seems like foolishness. Human wisdom or human beings who are wise, or so we think. We're wise in very time-bound ways. 
Andrew Wilson said, if you're appalled by some of the things your great-grandparents believed, don't worry, your great-grandchildren will be appalled by some of the things that you believe. Worldly wisdom, it just ebbs and flows, but godly wisdom is eternal. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now, you see this word mystery or uh, wisdom spoken in a mystery? A mystery, when, when we talk about it in Bible studies, it's, uh, boy, those kids are having a good time back there. They're like, let's never go back indoors. A mystery in the New Testament speaks of something that had been previously hidden but now it's been revealed. A lot of times it's something that was foggy and vague in the Old Testament, but is revealed in the New Testament. Someone said, Old Testament concealed, New Testament revealed. It speaks of something humans could only understand through divine revelation. And two specific things are part of God's hidden mystery that brought clarity uh, that was brought clarity. The cross with the resurrection mentioned in the Old Testament, not understood at the beginning of the New Testament. Remember the disciples didn't grasp it. Jesus in his resurrected state had to appear to them and kind of slap them around a little bit. Be like, I'm right here. You know, they had to have divine revelation to the mystery. And secondly, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian was another one of the mysteries. One other mystery I give you is uh, Ephesians speaks of the mystery that Jews and Gentiles would be made into one body in the church. But this mystery, this wisdom was ordained or predetermined beforehand. This shows that it's not from this world, but it's divine in its origin. And that it's for our glory. That's an interesting phrase. Maybe someone with more of a reformed bent is like aghast right now. No! It's supposed to be for his glory. My Westminster Catechism says, what's the chief end of men? You know, oh, the chief end of man is to glorify you and enjoy you forever. And we would also say with the reformed, amen, right? Yes, we want all things to be for God's glory, but we also get to enjoy him forever. And that's where God in his grace lets us partake in his glory. And he even says that the, the ministry of the word is even for our glory. That we would be glorified. He's those who he's justified. These he's also sanctified. Remember Romans 8? And those who he's sanctified, these he's also glorified. The Lord shares his glory with us. Spiritual wisdom is renewed to et uh, secure our eternal happiness. And now our last verse here. Man, I feel like I smell some food already. Like Anybody else getting a waft of the lunch being prepared? They're like, I don't know what you're smelling because we haven't gotten anything out yet. <laughs> it's my new um, taco deodorant that I got from Old Spice. Uh, so this mystery here, it was something that none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So it's such a mystery that all of the big wigs back in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, it was over their head. They didn't get it. If they would have got it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. That's why Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If they were so wise, they wouldn't have pinned him to the tree. In, Roman, or in Acts 2.24, Peter's preaching and he says, God raised Jesus up having loosed the pains of death because it wasn't possible that he could be held by it. 
They crucified the Lord of glory, but it's okay because he rose from the dead. He couldn't even, they couldn't hold him down even if they tried. I love this phrase, a title for Jesus, that he's the Lord of glory. The New Living Translation calls him the glorious Lord. Some scholars consider the Lord of glory to be the loftiest title Paul ever gave to Jesus. It's certainly proof that Paul regarded Jesus as God, the second person of the Trinity. It's inconceivable that Paul would give this title to any lesser being. If they would have known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. I don't know if you guys have been following uh, a guy named Russell Brand online. So Russell Brand, um, I just kind of know him from what I've been seeing uh, on X, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> I don't know if I'm talking to you like, what are you, what X? That's what Twitter is called now. Um, but there's this guy named Russell Brand, and if you saw a picture of him, you probably recognize him because he's an English-British uh, comedian, uh, an actor, he's a presenter, he's an activist, he's a campaigner. He really established himself as a stand-up comedian and a radio host before becoming a film actor. I've never seen any of his movies. Uh, I always just thought, oh, probably weird and dark and, and carnal. I kind of avoided anything that I saw him in. But what's been incredible is over the last probably year and a half, two years, to watch his heart start opening to Jesus Amen. and consider Jesus and just being very honest and transparent and real and trying to be reasonable and to watch the Holy Spirit open up this guy's heart and then he would just start asking questions on, I'm just gonna call it Twitter. It'll always be Twitter for me. Um, <laughs> he starts asking questions about, hey, I'm thinking of going to church. What church should I try? And he went, and he went to church and then he writes about how he uh, received Jesus as his Lord and his savior, and then he was gonna get baptized. Then he's showing that he got baptized, and it has just been incredible to watch this guy just be transformed. I just love it. And you just even look at his before and after pictures, you know, and this guy has been transformed. And uh, I'm gonna say something that if, if you know, you know. Um, he appeared with Tucker Carlson this week. If you don't know, you don't know, and that's good. If you know, you still don't know, and that's good. I don't think any of us know. But he was, I think it was something that Turning Point USA put on, and Charlie Kirk, and it was kind of like a Trump rally, I think, or something. But he appeared on stage at this with Tucker, and I didn't see the whole thing. But I, I caught, um, somehow he was asked to pray or something, and he gets down on his knees on stage, and he just pours out his heart in worship to Jesus. And it was so beautiful. But he said something to Tucker, uh, I don't know if it was before or after, I just saw it, and, uh, and I transposed it, I wrote it out today, I, I re-listened to it and wrote it out, and he says to Tucker Carlson, Christ chooses us. I wish I would have known that earlier. I wish I didn't think I was too clever for my grandmothers. I thought that I was too smart. I thought that I knew what was in the Bible even without reading it. Reading it is blowing my mind on a daily basis. I can't believe the profundity, the depth, the incredible beauty, the deep truth available to all of us. And I know there are many ways of receiving the Lord's truth and the Lord's wisdom, and it's transforming me very quickly. I didn't make a choice, Tucker, and I mentioned the way you operate as well, that there's a kind of surrender. I'm not saying that I'm, with not, that I'm without shame. I'm not saying I'm without fear, that at points I don't feel compromised and uncertain. I'm saying that since being baptized, since becoming Christian, I feel his presence continually. I feel it now in me. 
I feel at this moment, and I feel free. So incredible to hear him say that with thoughtful clarity and just boldness. And just as we close here today, you know, the gospel that we're talking about today, boy, it doesn't come clear to you through external means. It comes through divine revelation straight to your heart. You look like at a guy like C.S. Lewis, who was absolute a walking brain. And when he, when he was hearing of the gospel, he hated it and didn't want it to be true and was shoving it away. And it just kept shining into his heart to where he could no longer resist because the gospel chooses you. And I would just believe today, if you are here in this place, you're here for a reason today. That Jesus Christ has chosen you. He wants you to know how to be saved. And I just feel like it's a word for you today that you're going to have to set aside just everything that you trust in and hope in that's outside of Jesus. And I, I can sympathize. Oh, I want to rest and trust in that I'm, you know, an American. You know? Or I rest and trust that my dollar bill in my pocket and the quarter in my pocket say, in God I trust. And that just kind of lumps me into this American Christian thing that's going on. And I just would tell you right now, you've got to step away from that. Anything that's external and that's outside of Jesus and faith in Jesus, you've got to lay aside right now. We live in a culture that wants to take stock in, I'm a rural American. I'm hardworking. I'm not afraid of dirt. You know, I am charitable. I've done contributions. Um, you know, I've got a pedigree, I just whatever it is, like I vote a certain way, I'm involved in the community, just whatever it is that is apart from Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and I'm a sinner. That's what's needed today. Put your trust in Jesus. And I just tell you, if you are hearing him calling you right now, he has chosen you. Now, there's a mystery in it all. Are you going to choose him back? <laughs> and Russell Brand had to come to this point where he felt the Lord drawing him and he responded by saying yes to Jesus. Would you say yes to Jesus today? It's going to fly in the face of everything externally that you would rest in. Philosophical wisdom and wisdom from this world that's temporary. Any sort of trust in your riches or your wealth or your genealogy. Just, you got to put all of that aside and trust in the grace of God. It's so powerful and mighty to save. <coughs> and today I just want to give you an opportunity. Johnny can come up. The worship team can come on up. And I just want to give you an opportunity to put your trust in Jesus. Paul wants you to put your trust in the power of God today. Not in the wisdom of men. Maybe even today you're like, boy, Rory, you know, I guess you proved your point today because it was all so scattered and mumbled and jumbled and I'm just glad it's kind of all coming to an end. Well, praise the Lord. Because <laughs> I hope you don't even remember me at the end of the day. But you remember that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And you might remember what Russell Brand said that there was a moment in his story 
when he was baptized, he just felt the presence of the Lord with him continually. And how wonderful today that as we wrap up our summer series in the park, we have the baptism available. Got it filled up with water. And baptism is, uh, it's one of the visible displays of what God does in your life. So is communion. Today we took communion and you guys came up and you grabbed those cups and you hold a little cracker bread in your hand and it's a visible display of Jesus's body being broken for you on the cross, being pierced and, and wounded on the cross, absorbing the wrath of God towards you. And you take that and you crunch it and you bring it into your inner being. You say, I believe inside what you've done at the cross. And then you take the cup and it represents the blood of Jesus and how the blood atones for our sin, washing away our sin. And you drink that in and you receive, proclaiming that Jesus Christ, his blood washes away my sins. It's something that we do. It's called a sacrament in the church, a visible display of what the Lord has done for us. And now we move towards baptism, one of the sacraments. An external visible display where you would tell your family and your friends and our community, Jesus died for me. Jesus was buried for me. And Jesus rose again for me. I believe it. And now I'm standing here in the waters of baptism. I'm uniting myself with Jesus. And just as Jesus died and was buried so too, the old, I'm going to insert my name for the sake of display. The old Rory is dead with Jesus. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ through faith. Romans says, but the good news is that Jesus didn't stay dead. He also rose from the dead. So too, we in baptism were partaking in the Death and the burial and the submersion with Jesus, but also the resurrection new life as we come up out of the water. And so maybe today was a day that you put your trust in Jesus for the first time. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a second. And I would also say if today is the day you trusted in Jesus for salvation, today can also be the day that you show the world I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm with Jesus. If that's you right now, will you pray? I want to pray with you. And you can just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I am hearing today that I'm a sinner and that a sinner that rests and trusts in his own wisdom and her own ways and philosophies of the world that are vain and they're all passing away and I'm hearing that the wisdom of God endures forever even though it seems so foolish to the world to trust in a crucified Christ and to confess that you're we're weak but we got to trust in someone who's strong all that's hard on my flesh but I lay all that aside right now and I I do confess you to be my Lord today and my Savior who would come and wash away my sins and make me clean and bright again. Would you do that, Lord? Would you save me? Would you regenerate me? I want to be born again. <coughs> Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I could live for you today. Change my heart, change my mind, change my life. Amen. If you prayed that, I just encourage you to let somebody know uh, to come visit with me afterwards. But even more so, if you prayed that, would you join me at the waters of baptism today and make a bold statement to the world that you're a new creation in Jesus 
And then just in closing real quick, those of you that are Christians, you've been a Christian, I just you believed in Jesus, and you've never been baptized, I just want to encourage you to lay aside stubbornness, <laughs> lay aside worldly reasoning of why you shouldn't be baptized. I mean, it's really just disobedience that's coming out. I would just encourage you to obey the Lord today, joyfully, and to come to the waters of baptism, to let your family and friends know that, man, boy, I've been saying that I've been following Jesus, but I've been holding back on even one of the most basic things he calls me to do, and that's to be a baptized Christian. And just remember, just thinking of Russell Brand again, how do you put it? I'm saying that since being baptized... I feel his presence continually. And if you're a Christian that's just been kind of floundering in the faith, I would say that, man, if you haven't been baptized, that may be a reason why. You haven't yet stepped in one of those most basic principles of obedience as a Christian that the Lord's calling you to do. And he says, if you're faithful in the little things, I'll make you ruler over much. Well, I'm going to head that direction over towards the waters. And just during these uh, song or two, Johnny, feel free to reuse the song if you need to. But um, we're just going to pivot our chairs and kind of move our gathering over towards the waters. I know there's one little girl that's going to be baptized today. Uh, and maybe you would be bold and join her at the waters as we close up. So, uh, Lord... We just give uh, just our time of baptism to you. Anyone that's just, for some reason, there's been a pushback on making this obe obedient stand, Lord. Uh, would you just give them the grace to take a step forward, to follow you in all things, even when they don't seem rational? Why would I go in my clothes and get dunked in front of a bunch of people? No thanks. And it's just precisely a picture of faith and trusting the Lord when it doesn't make sense sometimes. Lord, would you help them in, in making a, a cognitive, obedient step of faith today for your glory and their good. Amen. Amen, you guys. Let's pivot that direction.